All right. Well, welcome to the show today, everyone. My guest today is Melissa Yu. She's the founder and director of Melbourne-based MCO Events and creator of the Ego Expo, which is Australia's largest streetwear and lifestyle expo. Melissa's been forced to overcome some incredibly hard challenges in her life. She actually lost her partner to suicide in 2014, which motivated her to start speaking about mental health and suicide prevention. I want to bring Melissa on the show to find out how she got through such devastating circumstances, how she's been able to channel that experience into her purpose and work, and the importance of prioritizing mental health in her own entrepreneurship journey with MCO events. So, Melissa, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, James. Oh. What an intro, it, I, love, I, love, I love hearing these intros because it's like, yeah, do you want to like follow me around and just give some amazing intros? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can definitely send that. You can use it for your bio if you like. <laughs> I'd love to start a bit about your your background and story just to get a bit of a sense of, of who you are, Melissa. So could you just tell us where you grew up? What was your upbringing like? Just a bit of your story, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. So... I'm I'm 29. I'm currently based in Melbourne. I'm from divorced parents and all up. I'm in a sibling of six. I've got two brothers and three sisters. Wow. So, grow, yeah, it's it's pretty busy back in um back in the family life. But growing up, I grew up in a small town called Patterson Lake. So for anyone that hasn't you know, discovered Patterson Lakes yet in Melbourne. It's towards the Mornington Peninsula. So it's along it's along this beautiful stretch of beach and coast. And the best way that I kind of describe it is the OC because that's really like how I felt like when I grew up. And that might all sound really amazing and picturesque, but for me, growing up back in the 90s, I was actually one of the only Chinese families that had migrated into this area. So it was very predominantly Western. And that being said, so growing up, I felt always like as a kid, you always want to fit in. You're always trying to fit in. You're always trying to blend in. You're always trying to make sure that you're part of that crowd. So I actually faced some early, quite early mental health challenges and just identity, um, not identity challenges, in just being the only Asian family in a Western community. So before I even really knew it, I felt like I was already born to stand out just from the colour of my skin. Yeah. And, yeah, and then my parents divorced when I was three and that was a very early offset of how challenging it can be to have two different homes. My parents both remarried quite quickly so my mum remarried with my stepdad and then my dad with my stepmom now. And as a young girl then, there, there was a lot of a lot of blame and a lot of potential just thinking it was my fault. There was a lot of that that took, I took on a key responsibility of thinking that my parents my parents broke up because of my brother and I. And which is completely not true. And in hindsight now I know that. But growing up I think I didn't have that awareness. And my mum then moved over to Sydney while I was quite early on. So I was in prep. So I was in I was five, six years old when my mum moved to Sydney and started building her her new family life there. So for the better of my childhood from six to all the way up through to eighteen actually, all the way up through to year twelve in high school, I was a fly in, fly out kind of child with my brother. <laughs> so we would we would um go to school with my dad uh, down here in Melbourne because that's where we built sort of most of our life. But then four times a year during those school holiday periods, I was flying back to my mum's, which was in Sydney. And that that was quite hard, to be honest. That was I loved my mum. I loved spending time there. But I was also like, why is it that I can't spend time with my friends in Melbourne because I'm always forced to go see family? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that that, I guess, all up though those experiences and this upbringing of being in quite a traditional Chinese family we lived with my grandma to growing up in Australia and in a again a western community that didn't necessarily have a lot of the Chinese community there at the time has forced me to be quite independent and to really start understanding who I was and 
what that journey looked like in a very, very early age, I think. Yeah, sounds like it incredibly, well, yeah, it would have been a very, had its challenges that upbringing, I'm, I'm sure. And I was, I was definitely curious if looking back on that, do you think that that kind of, in a way, helped shape you and helped build your character having to go through that? Uh, or was it kind of a case of, it was just a, a challenge that you were forced to overcome and it didn't really help or hinder you in any way? Any I thoughts think, on that? Yeah, I think everyone's got a story. And we, if we look at how we grow up, your childhood memories can create some serious foundations and some serious values to the person that you are at, in your adult life. You're, as a child, you're the most easily influenced by your peers and your environment. And growing up for me, no doubt, this has shaped a lot of my character. And, and a lot of those challenges have actually followed through into my upbringing. There's a lot of insecurities from there that I'll talk about later. And those insecurities, I suppose, because they weren't dealt with early on, they showed up later in my life when I experienced another loss in my life. Um, that we'll talk about and those same insecurities from my parents leaving and splitting up, they showed up again, but tenfold in another triggered environment. So, a hundred percent, my upbringing and my experiences and what I remember, like these are some. Yes, I just recapped my story, but these are some serious emotions and trauma as a little girl that I'm still processing now, well into my adulthood life. Yeah, I believe it. And I think, as you said, everyone kind of has defining things in their childhood, which affects their behavior as an adult. And I love that you have the awareness of that and, and things that you need to work through because it's definitely important because it can be really destructive when there's things that are unresolved and we don't even realize that it's driving our behavior and some of the bad things, well, not necessarily bad, but some of the just the, the habits we have and the, the ways we think about things, it can really drive that, which is not always deliberate or a good thing for us. So I believe that. So tell us, who's Gus? And can you tell us the story of how you first met him? Yes, I'd, I'd love to share that. And um, so what I just described before was well into about my 18 years of life. And straight out of high school, I was going straight into uni I was a pretty high achieving student in, like independently of like the Chinese pressures and everything but I was quite high achieving and I had gotten into Monash University and that was like pretty exciting I went to I went on to study psychology and after that high school break you've got that summer amazing summer period and I described meeting Gus as it was just a, an amazing summer fling to begin with so I was with a group of friends and we had boarded the last train um, into the CBD Melbourne city and on this train and on this carriage at the time there was no one else there it was the last train except for one boy and this boy was sitting quite shy and reserved on the on the carriage that I was getting on and his head was tilted along that window me being pretty overly confident, slightly intoxicated, went over and um, decided to introduce myself. <laughs> and on his phone, he had a hip top at the, at the time. And a hip top is when you used to slide this phone up and on the back you could almost have quite a big sticker. So we're going, it's almost like a Game Boy. <laughs> but um, his phone, at the back of his phone, it read G-U-S. So I just spelt it out and was like, Gus, hi, my name's Mel. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he introduced himself and it, didn't ask me to leave or anything so I went on to ask him to help me open up my drink my drink and he happily obliged there too and we both knew that it was a cruiser bottle which was a twist top at the oh. time so I didn't need any assistance whatsoever <laughs> but I, I felt I felt like he found that communication quite endearing yeah. and so so we took the the rest of the train there having some great small talk and exchange numbers down at Southern Cross Station and mm. That for me was really the beginning of everything. So, it's I, a real uh, southeastern suburbs of Melbourne love story. <laughs> uh, meeting on the Frankston Line train, asking to open your cruiser. I love it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Some of the best memories have been formed on that train line, and probably <laughs> some of the worst as well. <laughs> um, 
Um, but yeah, and it was, I just describe it as I'm 29 now. So I look back at a decade ago and it was incredibly young love. There was a lot of innocence in that purity of love. Everything from, you know, leaving this high school bubble into experiencing adulthood, you really are at that rites of passage. You really are at that time where you're being influenced and experiencing things and risk taking and um, partying. And that's kind of the lifestyle Gus and I really initially that first two years of our relationship went right into, you know, he was my rock star and mm. I was, just, you know, I was his everything. And we, you know, would terrorize the streets of King street and very, yeah, very, very Melbourne. <laughs> um, <laughs> to I've, I've definitely grown up from that but that was kind of initially how we how we fell in love yeah and so you were you were doing all these things together um kind of i guess as you said leaving a high school bubble going into adulthood together and really i guess like growing up and discovering the world together i know you were traveling a lot with each other as well so and then what happened in in january 2014 can you talk about what happened there? So we met early on in 2008. So that was, we were together for a better of six years, nearly six years in our lives. And like I described, it was very from that innocence to early adulthood together. And like you had said, James, we, we traveled a lot together. We just did everything together. We started building our home. We, we started leaving our past behind and really focusing on this future and building a future together. And talkings of you know marriage and a family and all of this was I'm not saying it is in terms of just it was a fairy tale but these were some real possibilities and expectations that we were beginning and Gus Gus I wouldn't say he had a mental illness at any point in his life I would more just say there was mental challenge mental health challenges throughout and over those times Although undiagnosed, we still made it through because there was love and passion there. But in January, so I'll describe a bit of the context of where we were by then. We we were very into our fitness. So I think instead of what I described earlier is about risk-taking behaviours and when you're young, we kind of channeled that energy into more healthy, positive behaviours, which was a really, really positive step forward for both mine and Gus's mental health. And so we started focusing on the gym. We definitely focused on traveling internationally a lot and experiencing different cultures and cuisines. Gus worked in a concrete laboring environment. So this environment was quite masculine. It was very alpha male, very dominant. And being in that environment, I don't believe, it, it paid very, very well, but it wasn't so much in support of showing a vulnerable side to men, which... Gus really struggled with. Gus really struggled being in an alpha male environment where when you were at the risk of potentially having relationship problems or feeling a bit sad, this stuff was not openly communicated with and was quickly shut down as well, I think. So you were not necessarily, you didn't feel heard. So he was in this environment from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we had built quite a sustainable and um, comfortable lifestyle. But that was, again, not without challenges. He was working six days a week, 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we they only had this Christmas break, this two-week Christmas break period. So we, over that period, we went overseas. Our last trip, we went to Cambodia and spent our Christmas and New Year's there. And when we came back, I guess, the context was that he was going to be back in this workforce and work environment for yet another year. And he was going to be back there until the end of December, which was Christmas again, which has a lot of work pressure. That's a lot of struggles. It's a lot of challenges there, just the for, for knowing that that's what's ahead. Yeah. And it was a it was an incredibly hot day on in January 13th, 2014. And he he had gotten quite sick actually. He had gotten quite sick in Cambodia. He's he is so adventurous, this guy, and he tried to eat all the street food. He tasted everything in life. Like, so he was like, oh, a cockroach, let's try that. Oh, a spider. And <laughs> much to my dismay, and to his westernised belly, plus his Australian, so to his western body, it just did not agree with him. So he had gotten quite physically ill. 
and that day he actually left work. It was his first day back at work and he had to leave halfway through work because he was feeling just so sick. So he had messaged me that day. I was working at the time. I was working in a bistro. So I had still just kind of come out of uni and um, was working three different hospitality jobs. And I remember checking my apron at about lunchtime during service and I'm not allowed to do that. So it was a quick glance at a phone and he had said, I've, I'm leaving work and gone to the doctors. I love you. And so I put my phone away and there was no alarm bells in that sense. That seemed a pretty normal day. And then he had sent me another message at four o'clock and four o'clock it read, I've, I've gone to the doctors, I'm going home. And I can barely see was what he was saying with his driving as well. So I could understand that he was quite extremely ill. Mm -hmm. So I finished my shift at about seven o'clock and it was just this really, really hot day. And I um, ended up going out for dinner with a couple of friends. And I remember going to message him just to touch base, but I got distracted and I put my phone away and I didn't message him. So by the time that I was returning back to our home, it was, it was 9.30 at night. And the cool breeze was potentially just coming in, but I just remember there was it was just so hot. And walking up the driveway, I saw Gus's car parked at the front and there was nothing really, again, no alarm bells. He was home, essentially. And I came in and I, I saw his medical certificate with his antibiotics on the coffee table. And so I went upstairs to the master bedroom and I turned on the master bedroom light and... Yeah, surprisingly, he wasn't there. He wasn't in bed, which that's when probably the first sort of, huh, oh, that's okay. And I found a quick reason. He must have been at the boy's house down the road. He was with a couple of friends and he was watching the Supercross. He was really into his um, motocross bike. And so I gave him a phone call. And then I guess this was the first sign of anxiety that I experienced because I, I heard his phone ring. And so I ran down. And I, I recall going out of the door and going to the car thinking that the phone was in the car and um, the car door was locked and I could he still hear the phone ringing and the phone wasn't ringing from inside the car. It sounded like it was ringing from the garage. And for me to get into the garage, I have to go back into the house and I have to cut through the laundry and back out the back door into the side door. And I found the source of the ringing and it immediately all I could feel was how cold it was. It was instantly just this overwhelming, intense amount of darkness and coldness. And I, I just knew. And I think I don't, you know, like I just, I don't even know if it was like I, the dog was barking and then the ambulances were sir sirening and I had, before I knew it, my house was filled with people and relatives and friends. And that was that was the night that Gus took his own life. So my partner of six years died by suicide and there's really no explanation as to exactly why. But what I've kind of come to terms with is I just call it the perfect storm. Perhaps there was just a little few, too many things in place that particular day that allowed him to not think clearly and to be really focused in on taking his own life and not wanting to be here. And over a series of circumstances and events, he just he was able to follow through with it this time. Yeah. That's so awful. And, yeah, I can't imagine ever going through that. So it's... Uh... I really appreciate you being open and, and sharing that. And what, I guess, what do you, what do you do next after that? How, how do you actually kind of move forward and, and try to make sense of it or go through your life? Like, I just can't imagine what, what the next steps are from that. So what, what did you do next? I think when you're that? losing a loved one in any way, and especially when it feels like it was before their time, is going to be incredibly difficult for anyone. And something like suicide has another huge layer on top of that because there's just this overwhelming amount of unknown and unanswered questions and what if. And 
as humans, I think we really want to find an answer. We're naturally problem solvers. It's what we do. So when something presents itself and there is no answer to it other than this is what you're left with, yeah, it was incredibly hard. It still is hard. Recapping that story to date, yes, I have done it before and I've, I've spoken quite openly and vulnerably about it, but it doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> and it's, it's a real lived experience of what I've gone through and how I've come through it, I suppose, is my initial response would be you survive. I think you just, all it is is you just try to survive. You take every hit as it comes, and I'm talking every breath, every minute, before maybe eventually it rolls into every day that it starts hurting. And then a couple months later, it might subside a little bit. And then yet when you smile or you feel guilty, like for that, you go back into this immense amount of grief. So it's been five years now since Gus has passed, and I have definitely learned to live fully, but not without doing some incredible amount of self-work. And and I'm talking, it, it's not like, you know, what we hear so much today, like self-love, gratitude. I'm like really implementing what these practices are has actually gotten me through the worst of days and has gotten me through to this unfortunate experience that actually doesn't happen to that many people and especially not this close. You might hear about suicide, but you don't imagine it happening under your own roof. Absolutely. I can't imagine. Is there any of those specific things that you, you can remember or that you can talk about if someone else can maybe get some uh, value from that if, if they're going through something similar? I think I always had... Although there were nights and days that I felt absolutely numb and that there was no more will to go on, I'm extremely blessed and grateful that I had an incredible support network. And I understand that this is a privilege. I definitely understand that I have family members and friends that came and stepped in and supported me when I couldn't get up. They, I'm talking they literally fed me, forced me to go to the bathroom, one of my best friends actually would be in the bathroom with me just in fear of anything happening. And that was the initial thing, right? A lot of people were, were genuinely quite worried at how I was going to be able to survive this because mm-hmm. when you think about it, people just say, I don't know what I'd do. And so they really, really, the whole community really felt for me. And at such a young age at 23, I was planning my partner's funeral when... Most 23-year-olds are enjoying life or like their, the, the world's their oyster, their future's ahead of them and mine ceased to exist in one moment. And so when that does happen, you really got to start asking yourself, well, you do, you ask yourself the hard questions like why me? You do get into a little bit of that victim mentality, like what did I do wrong and why did this happen to me? But then I started shaping my message and my story and the event a little differently. So I I really just was like, okay, this has happened. I can't change it. He's not coming back. But what can I learn from this? What can I actually learn from this? And how can I help others so that this does not happen again? Because unfortunately, Gus's story and suicide, it happens so often. And especially among young men in Australia aged between 18 and 25, we see a huge spike in people taking their own lives so in a way for me healing I I just started writing about it I started talking about it how I how I like sucked the poison out and like the pain from my heart was I I shared it with the world and I know this might seem incredibly daunting for people to be completely naked and let everything out and just talk about how hard it was it was the most it was the best thing that i could have done because people then the community the outpour of love and reach that i was able to have that got me through so it was my community and my support and if anyone's going in that deep dark place and again i know this is a i know your audience james it it is business but business and entrepreneurship all has mental health challenges so whenever someone's going in that deep dark place, and we all get there, we've done that when we we don't close a deal or 
we're in a startup phase where it's just all grind and no profit and all of that. So when you're in that deep dark place, just don't lose hope and, and leverage your support network and community network. Put your hand up if you need help because I guarantee you someone will see you put your hand up and someone will reach out and help you up because that's, that was the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's great advice and it's a powerful message as well that, yeah, if people, whether it's in business or in life, not everyone has to go through something as tragic as you've been through. We all we all do sometimes go through some challenges, as you, as you mentioned, that might not be quite to that scale, but they can be challenges. And don't be afraid to to reach out and share what you're you're going through. And you'd be surprised at your support network. A lot of the times, people will will come to help you, and and they can help you through that. So, yeah. And how many message. people? How many people would resonate with it? So. It just it gives people perspective and it makes it allows people to not feel so alone in it, even if it's just like I I've made no sales this week or some like or I had a breakup. The amount of people that might not have gone through the exact same situation as you, but they've got empathy for you. They can sit where you sat and can pull an experience from their own story and journey and really relate. And they might not have had the courage to put into words, but when you do and someone sees it. And they don't feel so alone anymore. That's incredible. Mm, absolutely, couldn't agree more. So, how have you kind of taken this experience and kind of transformed that into your your purpose? Has a lot of it just been, as you mentioned, sharing the story, showing people that they're not alone? Has that kind of been the main way you've taken some good from that, where you can, or is there any other ways you have? So the, it, it really did. I call, I call Gus's death in my life as the fork in the road. It was really a deciding place for me where I had to, I could have gone both ways. I could have gone down this really bad rabbit hole and spiral and um, gone back to sort of old behaviours of drug and alcohol addiction or I could have utilised what I've done now and really become hopefully a beacon of hope and a beacon of light and I show, and I show up. I show up now with more meaning and purpose in just the way that I stand, in just the way that I talk. And everything that my personality and my authentic self brings now is all because of that. It's mm. 100% it's all because of that pain that I have gone through. I've made that mess, my message now. And now I'm, after five years though, now I'm kind of, speaking Mel's story. So for a long time there, when I just de described that healing process, I think I was still really sharing Gus and Mel's identity and Gus and Mel's story. And it has been really, really beneficial to have Gus's story shared like that. But what I've found recently, like more recent than ever, is that, oh my God, I'm still alive. Like I still have this whole incredible story myself that I can share about how I got through that. But now I'm living my life and I'm living my life with intention and purpose and that has value as well. Mm. And so, so that's kind of been a real shift, I think, in my own self-awareness and my own journey is realising that we all have unique stories and even though some people have influenced us so incredibly much and our purpose and our passion, you still got to tell your story. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to talk a bit more about your your kind of latest ventures and story as well but I guess just while we're still on this on this phase of your life is there any overarching message or just any sort of little piece of information you just really want to make sure that people understand when it comes to to mental health or any of that sort of stuff any overarching message you would pass on I do I think I think anyone that is going through mental health challenges it's a, a really refreshing reminder to ground yourself in realising that life is 10% what happened to you and 90% what you do after it. It's not your fault. It is not your fault when you grew up in a low socioeconomic area. It's not your fault if your parents abused you or weren't there to be able to support you. There's a lot of things that are not your fault, but realising that everything is your responsibility to change that has really, really 
helped myself and a lot of other successful thought leaders in this. I'm not original in this thought. I'm paraphrasing it, of course, but it's definitely your responsibility taking full accountability of your life's decisions and your mental health can turn around should you wish to do so. Yeah, that's a great message and I couldn't agree more with that. We can't be responsible for what happens to us, but we are responsible to what happens next. I totally believe that. So I'd love to talk a little bit about your own entrepreneurship journey, especially with MCO events. And maybe we could go through the story of how how that came about because events is a really tough tough space to get into. So I was wondering, how did you, how did MCO events come about? Maybe we could go through the journey of, of that, of how you ended up with this events business. Yeah. And so I've never really been an entrepreneur in the sense that I wasn't a kid that sold lemonade at the, at the lemonade stand. I wasn't flipping baseball cards like Gary V was. I didn't have that initial entrepreneurship tendency or quality, I don't think. But over time with what's happened to me in my personal life, I became a lot more intentional with where I wanted to be. And so psychology, although was really, really great for me, and I was making a difference one-on-one with clients, and um, I wanted to make more of an impact. And I wanted to do a lot more with one-to-many. And I ended up falling in a role with the Australian Tattoo Expo. So it was very, very completely left wing of everything that I was doing. And I ended up falling in this convention trade show space with an industry that is so niche and so <laughs> sometimes too cool for school. But yeah, the tattoo industry welcomed me in. And I think I worked incredibly hard as well to understand the culture and the meaning behind it. And I was able, I was fortunate enough with my the company there that I was working for up and be a pretty significant role, a project manager role, running these national trade shows around Australia. So we had about 10 to 12,000 people per weekend in each major city that the event was held in. And so I'm not going to say like, I'm not going to really say anything bad about this company or anything because I've had the most fondest memories and experience and skill sets from it. But MCO events, if I have to be true to myself, was born out of frustration. For me, working in a work culture for four and a half years and I was like I said I think I'm honest like genuinely quite high achieving Mm -hmm. but the work culture didn't acknowledge or made me feel appreciated in this environment which was quite difficult for me Um, I'm sure other people that have worked in corporate companies and large businesses and watching the scale and the profit scale and everything but not feeling valued when you can easily slip into feeling like an employee number, there's a level of frustration there that sometimes life pushes you to change or at least try. So for me, after that amazing role there, I think for me I'll just say I hit a glass ceiling there and really wanted to test the boundaries of what I guess Mal Yu could do because I had acquired this amazing skill set that I, I don't think that I – was being in tune or like working in alignment with my own core values. So that comes down to self-awareness and realising, hang on, this set of values doesn't potentially match my set of values. So MCO events was born out of frustration from there. I left that. I left my corporate life and um, my high-paying job Mm -hmm. and I started my own events business. So MCO Mm -hmm. is a... It is a boutique agency. We do everything from concept to delivery in events. And as you said, events is a very high-pressured, putting out fires kind of role. But I, I wanted to utilise my skill set, and this is where I'll talk a little bit about Ego Expo, which is our flagship event. And I wanted to use my skill set in this trade show and convention space, but apply it to something that was in line with my core values. So the idea of Ego Expo came because... I had a few friends, like five or six friends that were starting e-commerce fashion brands. So these businesses were starting from a Shopify account, you know, um, in that early process of screen printing a T-shirt, I suppose, with a logo and and shipping from home or going and selling it at the local communities and clubs. 
And I saw this common thread that people weren't getting their stories out. And I understood that consumers buy stories and they buy on emotion. They don't necessarily just buy a product. Mm -hmm. So I started digging a bit deeper and I'm like, well, what's the difference between one streetwear brand and the other? Like really it's just a logo on this same, exactly the same quality T-shirt as well. And how do you get a brand? How do you leverage a brand to become wanted in the marketplace in such a saturated fashion industry as well? So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we got all these founders of these little independent brands that were able to come out and set up shop together, we build a community around this because there's enough brands and Shopify accounts out there. And so what if we built them and the founders got the opportunity to share their story? So now it's no longer about buying a logo from a T-shirt. It's buying into an ethos and the values of what this founder represents. So I got really, really excited by this and I looked in the marketplace and I looked at the Australian sort of fashion e-commerce business side and there is currently no business, no platform that serves it the way that this, this platform could. So Ego Expo became the Ego Expos. It was a play on words and it was all about identity. So Ego feeds our, um, Ego is all about identity and fashion feeds that. Whether you dress it up or you dress it down, we all have one to play a part in. But there's more there's more to us than meets the eye and there's more than us than meets the ego. And there's more than us that meets the clothes that we wear as well. So this was the first opportunity where Australian millennials and pop culture could come together and leave their ego at the door and actually come and experience people for who they are and who they were and just saw people and gave them an opportunity to listen and to share their story. And I moved quite quickly. Surprisingly, I look back and I'm like, I don't act, this is probably where the entrepreneurial journey and the spirit really started coming in because it was passion and there was fire in it and there was risk and there was, it was this whole startup journey about just getting people on board. This was literally an idea in my head. It, I could have been selling unicorns for all that mattered. <laughs> but, but come 2018 when it was launch of this massive Australia's first and largest streetwear expo that was built in my head, we um, and not without challenges, of course, but we opened our doors on February 17th and 18th, 2018 to 50 exhibitors of brands one including Volley Australia that signed on board and we had four food trucks, we had all these fashion runways, we had a basketball tournament and just under 2,000 people came through those doors for that first show. So um, it was pretty exciting. It was it was really, really exciting but I think, um, yeah, that's kind of how like MCO events and Ego Expos started. And now we're coming up to our third year and the organic growth and that community, we've only just begun. When I look back now, I'm like, we're still a startup. I'm, we're 100%, we are still a startup. We're just as hungry. We have just as little resources <laughs> um, that we're fighting. And our team of little sort of entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial spirits uh, are continuously working very, very hard. And I think for me, that had a lot to do with my leadership as well. So being an entrepreneur, having an idea, it's all good and well to have an idea, but you've got to be able to inspire and lead people to follow in your steps and to help you build your dream because no man's an island. You don't build a business on your own and it was all you. You've got to give it back. And for us, you really got to give it back to the community. So our platform, because of my personal story, our events all have a social element in it. All our events will always have a social impact and you'll see that. You'll see us always fundraising where ticket, ticketing fees will go to a charity like Beyond Blue or Lifeline Australia. Um, last, this year we did one for COT, Christmas on the Streets, that was all about raising money for the homeless. So, yeah, you'll see us always having a social impact on that. But I think that's as a founder and as a leader of this business, that's something that the values I will – I will instill in that and carry that through. Yeah, it's cool. It's a it's a great story and and it looks like a great expo as well. And you did mention that there were some challenges along the way there. So I was I was curious if maybe we could dive a little bit into that because it sounds great. You know, like quit your job, 
start this agency in your head and then one, two, skip a few. You've got the Southern Hemisphere's largest yeah. <laughs> lifestyle uh, <laughs> and streetwear expo. So maybe we could fill in the gaps a bit. Was there any major challenges in that transition? Yeah, there was some real, real big challenges. One, number one thing in business, cash flow. Oh, my gosh. Um, figure out your cash flow and have some real tight budgets because it, especially with events, things can go blow out of proportion um, in production. So cash flow became a huge challenge for us between year one and whether we were even going to run a year two. And that just came from a lot of learning. There was we were just spending way too much than what the money was coming in. And although we, I just said like 2,000 people came through the doors, we were spending more than that as a ticket price for that income coming through. And so we really had to, I had to knock a lot harder for sponsorship deals the second year. And I had to, I had to swallow my ego a little bit as well and um, realise like I'm quite transparent in the first year we made no money. You know, we really, we really, really made no money in our first year, but it's having that fight and that passion, that grit to carry on and to go again and to reinvest somehow differently and play your cards a little bit differently with experiences. So cash flow was a huge challenge for us. And another thing is I had, we had a lot of legal issues going on that was really hard on our business and um, that was, that was a challenge when we had people sort of sending us cease and desist letters. I won't name the company, but <laughs> I said that the idea was born out of frustration. There was a lot of frustration, I guess, that came out from that too. And Got we it. had we had a lot of businesses that were um, kind of saying, you've taken our IP, which the industry that I was previously in to the industry that I'm in now, fashion, was completely unrelated. So that was... It wasn't successful on their behalf. However, it took up a lot of my mental health and my emotional challenges. So anyone starting a business as well, I, I, I see it a lot with recruitment companies, people working in a recruitment company and then starting their own recruitment company or people being an accountant and then starting their own account being aware of what those potential legal challenges are and making sure that you're protected in all your written agreements. I can't stress enough about having a paper trail for everything because there's too many business deals that have gone wrong over a handshake. And yes. at the end of the day, it's just not going to hold up in court. Like we shook on it, bro. Like I, um, you know, like, but you, I, I had your word is something that you've heard a lot. And yeah, yeah I can't stress enough about those challenges in a business. If you're, building a business from the start just make sure that your company structure and things really do make sense and if you don't have a clue what that means ch talk to a lawyer talk to a accountant just make sure that you're if you don't have the resources go find that resource and make sure that you get one two three or four more opinions on it as well because e everyone has an opinion so opinions come free mm -hmm. but making sure that those advices and stuff seeking people that you trust and yeah that will cover a lot more hiccups as well. So they were my two big ones, I think. Understanding your company legal structure as well as your cash flow and your budget. If you're not good with numbers, again, zero, I use zero and online um, payment platform software. There's, there's just so much tutorials and stuff that you can actually learn now. So making sure that you're educated before you actually go and take action. Yeah, it's great advice. I think because um, a lot of entrepreneurs tend to be big thinkers and have big high level ideas, which is great. But then sometimes the actual process of bringing that into fruition and a lot of the the uh, nitty gritty details get glossed over, which comes back to bite you a lot of the time. So it's great advice. Yeah. So Ego Expo, that's, that's a once a year event. So that's obviously a, a big part of your business and where it sort of all came from. What's, what do you do the rest of the year? So you, I understand you kind of do a lot of other smaller events and I'm guessing that kind of ties you over while you're, you're sort of planning the, the next Ego Expo. What's what's your main other sort of events that you run through the business? So we run a lot of other events, including restaurant launches and VIP nights. So, for example, a restaurant might be opening and they need a launch event, which includes a PR campaign and social media influencing or anything like that. So we, as MCO, we're, we become contracted. So a lot of businesses, even we've worked with campaigns for like Are You OK Day and things. So with a lot of businesses, we do, we want to be that second team that doesn't take you away from your work. 
when there's a gala on, when there's a corporate breakfast, when there's something that you need to get done, but everyone, you don't want to defer your employees to do that and then forget all about their other stuff. We that's where we can come in and have that holistic approach and work within the culture, within your project and event goals, but it's outsourced. And for example, another one that we're doing at the moment, it's a real estate agent that a property agent that has a social impact community fundraiser. So they they hire us and we do all their council permits. We literally do all the run sheets, all your staff volunteers, all your storeholders, whatever it takes to run whatever event and goal that you have. Um, yeah, that's kind of what we do. And we, we then write an event report and show you guys all the findings. That's great. And Outside of that, though, um, which goes back to kind of what we were starting on as well, and this is what, you know, sort of the idea of a serial entrepreneur comes in. You, entrepreneurship is you've got ideas. That's what you're kind of there for, and you're trying to problem solve and you're testing markets. So for me, I'm, in, I'm dabbling in the event space as well, but then I've also got a little bit of interest down in the um, public speaking path. I'm doing a lot of keynotes at the moment and building my personal branding there with um, being a mental health and suicide prevention advocate. And a lot of those guest speaking opportunities are paid opportunities. And that being said, there was a, an, a, a whole amount of free speaking events mm. as well that I did to build my brand up. But now year four and five sort of in, in my advocacy for this space, I do get a lot of paid speaking roles. I'm yep. also wanting to move in, as well as this podcast space, I'm also wanting to move into sort of mentor mentorship and coaching. It ties in with my skill set in events. So we've lately been sort of trying to run some mastermind classes and seeing what that looks like, some mental health gratitude classes, some self-awareness classes, tying in startup business with my experience in business as well, but also using some key professionals and creating a creating a workshop or a boot camp around that, which is, again, centred around events, but with a core focus of bringing in these startups, the best chance of success instead of failure. That's awesome. Up to a lot of things. It's great. <laughs> Talking about um, speaking, one thing I was really curious about, how did you end up interviewing Mark Wahlberg? You oh, done your research. You have done your research, James. Um, so I was, I'm a big networker and I believe if you're in the world of business and you understand that business to business is just people to people at the end of the day, it's pretty important to make sure that you're knocking on those right doors and building your amount of contacts in a very genuine and authentic way. So I do that through a lot of social events. And I happen to be a student of JT Fox. JT Fox is a American Canadian business coach. If you know him, you'll know him. And if you don't, like, <laughs> I'm sure he's going to do an ad for you or something soon because he's everywhere. This guy is everywhere. But I was fortunate enough to be part of his 1% class. And he was giving out this opportunity where he was taking one student from every country to this massive end of the year conference called Mega Success to interview either Mark Wahlberg or John Travolta, which was pretty awesome. And I was one of the lucky Australian students to then be able to give the opportunity to interview Mark Wahlberg on a stage in front of 2,500 people. And wow. that was yeah, that was euphoric and intense, I remember. And it was just so awesome, though, because what I actually learned from that experience and being able to rub shoulders and give Mark a hug on stage and also then, you know, have a chat with him backstage and take a photo with him, what I've really, really realised is that we're all the same. You know, we put people on a pedestal and I did myself. Like, I was getting, like, heart palpitations <laughs> at um at interviewing this, you know, it's Marky Mark. <laughs> that um, when I got on stage with him, it was just so easy to have a chat because they're just so real. And I think almost, and I haven't met Dwayne Johnson myself, but the people like The Rock and like I, I've seen Arnie with some of my friends and the it's almost like these people that we put on this celebrity tier status, these guys are so humble and they're mm. so incredibly real and genuine that you it's like talking to an old friend 
<laughs> yeah, so it was um, it was really, really amazing. I know no one, not everyone, gets an opportunity to sort of just hang out with Mark Wahlberg and stuff, but like this was an opportunity that I, I just have, I guess I happened to be at the right place at the right time, and I said yes. That was the most important thing. It was a risk, and I said yes, and I, I like, I just left and traveled to America. So it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was an incredible opportunity that also then helped my brand I think a lot so this it comes up in a few interviews when people find the footage or the photos and it's a pretty good conversation to have I suppose because it's rare but yeah say yeah. yes to the opportunities you never know where it's going to take you and um go with go with your gut there's things that it's like it might it might be a risk but every day's every day's a risk anyway that's right I love that that's such a cool story say yes to to opportunities for sure and it's so true what you said people are people we kind of idolize celebrities or some people do but at the end of the day we're all people and i totally believe that so it's a it's a great message and learning from that whole experience so sort of coming up on the the end of the interview here melissa it's been an awesome conversation so far appreciate you being candid and open about everything so just a few quick questions just to tie out the the interview here What's next for you and for MCO events? So you've obviously got Ego Expo. It's a big journey for you. You mentioned some some coaching, some uh, mentorship, and some some other extra speaking things on the side like that. Is that kind of your main focus at the moment, or is there anything in particular coming up for you? So the I mean, the long term goal would be seeing Ego Expo reach a larger audience every year on year, but also being in each major city. So right now what we're seeing with Ego Expo is we've got fashion labels that are flying down from Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide and Sydney down to Melbourne in Australia. But we would love that to become an international reach as well, which there's no stopping us there. So we want to kind of go Australasia as soon as the, the reach and the audience and the funds allow us to but reaching each major city would be a long-term goal there some short-term goals in in terms of this year and i spoke to you about this when we met is to get now you having a podcast and hosting <laughs> a podcast so um that's i think is really really beneficial for businesses and i just i'm sick of having it as an excuse or a dream or a, oh, i should start a podcast i'm just going to do it so I, awesome. I won't even say much more about that you'll just see that sort of out in, on iTunes and whatnot and all the <laughs> accounts there. And awesome. some other small um, immediate goals would be I'm actually trying to roll out some mental health advocacy and speaking in schools. Like we had said earlier when we touched base, I really believe that children and education is where we can come from a preventative measure instead of a reactive measure around these suicide challenges and um, mental health things that are naturally going to come in life but having these kids what I find is having the youth battle ready when they come out into the real world so they're not struggling so much by being so shocked at the difference between high school and adult life I'm really trying to play in that space so hopefully with uh with some really key other other keynote speakers being able to roll out a program of all the things that they didn't teach us at school so there's That's some short thank you yeah great projects and yeah can't wait to to listen to the podcast and see <laughs> the programs you roll out so yeah i'll keep an eye out for that so is there anything i haven't asked you mel or anything you just really want to make sure that you pass on to the audience before we finish up here today I just think um, reach out if if you like this and enjoyed this. I think it's really important to share it, share it with a friend because you never know who this might help. Share it with a business partner or a staff that you have potentially seen struggling. Look after one another as well. Really, like if you're a business owner and you, we've talked about employees and having that workplace culture to make people feel appreciated and valued, yeah, don't let a good staff go. Like really, really make sure that they, they know that they're valued. And yeah, reach out if um to James or myself if there's anything that you'd like us to expand on as well. So I'm contactable on I'm everywhere. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. So yeah, I'm sure James will put up some links or something like that. Absolutely. That was gonna be my last question. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Is Instagram the best way, would you say, or 
Yeah, I think, look, I am one of those millennials that I probably use Instagram the most. I do get back to everyone. It might take a bit of time on my DMs, but I actually do make an effort to get back to everyone. So my Instagram handle would be at MallyU, which is M-E-L-L-I-E-Y-U. And, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to reach me. Awesome. And, yeah, I'll definitely link up all your your various profiles so that people can reach out. But... Wow, this was an amazing conversation and yeah, I really appreciated you just being honest about your, your journey and, and sharing what you've learned from an incredibly challenging experience and then how you've grown from that and the way you've applied it, taken the positive, the very few positives that you could out of it and applied it to, to your life and what you've done now with MCO events and all the other work you've done is really amazing. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing that, Melissa, I really appreciate your time. No, thanks so much for your platform and all the good work that you're you're doing and spreading the message out for all the people that need it. So good on you, James. You're building an audience there, so keep at it. I appreciate it. So yeah, like I said, everyone listening, I'll link up Mel's various channels. Go reach out to her. Tell her your biggest takeaway from this interview, things you're going to implement. Just say thanks for coming on and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. See you later. Bye. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to this interview with Melissa today. I really hope you got a lot of value from the interview. It was an incredible story. And if you did, I've got a quick favor to ask. If you use Apple Podcasts to listen to this, can you just go into the app and leave me a rating and a review? And that really helps me out because it helps with the show ranking, helps more people discover the show and spreads this message. And even if you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can still help me out. If you take a screenshot of yourself listening to this episode, post it to Instagram stories, tag me in that. And if you could do one of those two things, it would really help me out and it would mean the world. So hope you enjoyed the interview and hope you have a great day.